After completing Gran Turismo 4's most notorious race, Mission 34, I can finally begin the actual challenge run I wanted to do, beating Gran Turismo 4 doing only 200 point races. This game has a mountain of content, European, American, Japanese events, endurance races, one make races. 100%ing this game is absolutely beyond the scope of this challenge, so I'll be focused on just triggering the ending credits. This can be done by beating the Gran Turismo World Championship, one of the hardest events in the game. This event is located in the professional events, but I can't play it until all of the beginner and other professional events have been beaten. So before I get started, you're probably wondering, what even is a 200 point race? Well, it's really simple. Just before a race begins, the game will show you how many points you'll get if you win, and this value maxes out at 200. Seems simple enough. The amount of points the game offers you is proportional to how difficult the race is going to be. If my car is too good relative to the competition, I won't be able to get 200 points. But if my car is way too slow, the race becomes impossible to even win. I've already completed all of the licenses and driving missions to give myself a strong start, and I head into what is supposed to be the easiest event in the game, the Sunday Cup. The opponents here are all pretty slow, so I decide to use my slowest car, my precious Volkswagen Lupo. I leave it completely stopped to size up how many points I'll be offered, which ends up being 81. I thought this was going to be fine. I knew that before a race began, I could add up to 200 kilograms of weight to reduce the car's performance. A worse power to weight ratio would mean I would end up getting offered more points. But the thing is, I lost this race, and it wasn't even close. I think I may have made a horrible mistake starting this challenge. I just lost in what is essentially supposed to be one of the tutorial races. Even if I somehow confirmed that the stock Lupo was good enough to win, I learned that adding the maximum of 200 kilos to the car only increased the amount of points by about 25. If I couldn't make the Lupo worse than this, I would have to get an even crappier car and win with that. Enter the Nissan BE1. This little car has only half the power as the Lupo. A massive difference like that will definitely give me a 200 point race. But if the Lupo couldn't win, how is this little red car ever going to do it? Well, there are some key upgrades we can buy and not all of them affect the points rating of the car. I head into the Nissan tuning shop and increase the power a tiny bit, buying the racing exhaust and the racing chip. These two upgrades will increase the points rating of my car, but this car is so bad, this won't put the race under 200 points. Another useful thing about these two upgrades is that they are removable, so just in case it makes the car too good, I can take them off. Then there are a whole bunch of upgrades that don't have any effect on the points value. I buy the racing brakes so I can shorten the deceleration time for corners, and I buy the triple plate clutch and racing flywheel. Both of these parts help the car's acceleration, most notably shortening the time between gear shifts. Another upgrade I get is super close gearing. This will force all of the gears really close together, increasing the acceleration further at the cost of top speed. Since this car is already really low on power, this seems like a necessary sacrifice. But the most important upgrade to get more power is NOS. With this upgrade, you begin each race with a small tank of nitrous oxide. Just like in the movies, when used, it grants an incredible increase in power without changing the points rating of the car. There is literally no drawback from buying it, but since it's a limited supply, the longer the race is, the less of an impact it will have. With all this, I head back into the first race of the Sunday Cup, and we can see this car is still worth a 200 point race, and it is quite capable of beating the competition here. The Sunday Cup comprises of 5 individual races, and since the pool of AI cars is relatively the same, there isn't really much extra to go over. I will say that in race 3, I swapped the super close gearing for the stock settings, as high speed ring really is a track where top speed is a large factor. Overall, these 5 races are pretty easy, so I'm going to give this a 2 out of 10 for difficulty. For completing the Sunday Cup, I'm awarded a cute little Auto Bianchi, which I don't end up using. The next two events are the FF Challenge and the FR Challenge, requiring me to use a front-engined front-wheel drive car and a front-engined rear-wheel drive car respectively. 
The FF challenge can be entered with the Nissan BE-1, but it's just way too underpowered. So I hop back into my Lupo and buy Racing Brakes, Triple Plate Clutch, Racing Flywheel, NOS, everything that'll give me an advantage without changing the points rating. This was definitely a step up in difficulty compared to the Sunday Cup. The first race was extremely close. I was almost outrun on the final straight by a Mitsubishi Eclipse despite me using NOS, which the AI doesn't have, and the second race was a complete cakewalk, leading me to strongly believe the AI drives better on some courses rather than others. After crashing on my first attempt of race 3, I end up narrowly succeeding on the tight circuit of Hong Kong, probably one of my least favourite tracks in the game, and race 4 was another close victory. Race 5 was a bit of a problem though. Twin Ring Mategi is a rolling start track, effectively spacing the cars out further and making early overtaking more difficult. To add to this, the lead car was the fastest AI car by far, and I wasn't even close to winning, even though I didn't make a single mistake during this race. The solution was super simple. I just quit out and re-entered the race, switching up the lineup of opponents, and this time, I was able to squeeze out the final win in the FF series. Overall, I give this a 3 out of 10 for difficulty. I'm awarded another useless prize car, and then decide how I want to tackle the FR challenge. The only car that I have that qualifies for this is the Mercury Cougar, which I won for completing the S license, but it's a bit overpowered even when completely stock, so I go and buy a BMW 120D with a few upgrades. It turns out, I may have overshot it by buying the racing exhaust and racing chip. Instead of taking them out of the car, I just reload the race and with different competition, this time I'm offered 200 points and get another victory. Race 2 was another quick win, but I was stuck resetting on race 3 for about 10 minutes since the competition wasn't quite good enough. Eventually I was offered a 199 point race, so I decided to just add a few kilograms to the car since I was fed up with the resets, and races 4 and 5 went similarly, just get as close to 200 as possible and then add a few kilos to the car to make up the difference. I found the FR challenge a bit easier than the FF challenge. Maybe because the 120D was closer to the point threshold than the Lupo, as I was getting a few races under 200 points. Anyway, I give it a 2 out of 10 for difficulty, and for my troubles, I win an old Nissan Skyline, which actually might be useful for one of the harder races later. I decide to start working on the professional hole, beginning with the Turbo Cup. The Nismo 270R I got from the International A license will work perfectly, and I upgrade it with the usual suspects and add the weakest turbo kit. The first race I win pretty quickly, but the game refuses to put me up against good enough competition in race 2, so I remove the turbo, taking 30 horsepower out of the car, and immediately this is enough to ensure the races are 200 points. This did make the rest of the races more difficult, and there was one particular car that gave me a lot of trouble, the Peugeot 205 Turbo 16. Every time I raced against it, it was always close and it forced me to use up all my NOS just to get in front and stay ahead. If the races were any longer, I don't think I would have been able to win. 3 out of 10 for difficulty. I get my prize car and move on. I'm starting to get confident. This isn't all that challenging. Even though I'm usually not completely blowing out the opponents, most of the time I'm winning each race in 3 or less attempts. For the Clubman Cup, I use my DeLorean which I won from beating driving missions 1 through 10. This one actually ended up being more difficult than I anticipated. In the first race, I ended up racing against a Lotus Elise. With the parts I bought, I found that beating the Lotus was practically impossible, so I did my trick of backing out and trying to get a different lineup. The thing was, the Lotus actually brought up the average so much that I couldn't get a 200 point race even if I added more weight to the car, so I had to resort to another trick to make my car worse, changing the tyres. Gran Turismo 4 offers a wide range of tyre types to choose from, and depending on which ones you use, they affect the points rating of your car. The grippier the tyre, the higher your car will be rated. The tyres are separated into three groups, normal, sports and racing. Racing tyres are the best and there are five grades from super soft through to super hard. The harder the tyre, the worse the grip and the more points will be offered. Below the racing tyres are the sports tyres, soft, medium and hard. And then there are the normal tyres which are all terrible. The best being road, then comfort, and then economy. All three types of normal tyres are so bad that you can actually purchase them for free. They offer the largest boost in points but they make the car nearly undrivable. The DeLorean comes fitted with sports softs, so I buy the sports mediums which boost my points a tiny bit. 
and I get my ass handed to me by a different car this time, the Opal Speedster. I know I can beat all the other cars, but as long as the Elise or Speedster are racing, it's going to be impossible to win. I keep resetting until I get a lineup without both of these menaces, and this tanks the points I'm offered. Because of this, I'm forced to use the best of the normal tyres, Road. The driving experience is quite unpleasant, as I have to make sure I don't go into any corner with too much speed. Small mistakes could be corrected with sports and racing tyres, but the normal tyres punish these small mistakes by forcing the car to heavily understeer, thus forcing you to slow down even more. The second and third races in the series cause more trouble, as there are even more cars that can absolutely crush me. The Toyota MR2 and Peugeot 205 T16 are also cars that can make winning impossible if they start at the front of the grid. After about two total hours, I grind my way through the Clubman Cup, and difficulty wise, I would give it a 6 out of 10. Back in the beginner hall is the sports truck race. There's only about 6 cars in the entire game that can enter and one of them is glitched. I buy the Dodge 1500 Laramie. This car for some reason is rated extremely poorly despite it not actually being that bad. So no matter the competition and how much power I give it, I'm always offered a 200 point race. I basically max it out and crush the other trucks. Because of this glitch, I don't use it in any other competitions that it's able to enter. 1 out of 10 for difficulty. And now I get stuck. I want to do the boxer spirit races next and the only type of car you can enter with are ones with boxer engines. The only two manufacturers in the game that produce cars with boxer engines are Subaru and Roof. The boxer spirit competition's a bit strange. All of the other competitions so far have a pretty smooth curve from the slower to faster AI cars. If there are one or two really fast ones, I keep resetting until they aren't racing. The problem here is that there is an extremely small set of cars that can race, and the speed curve between them isn't smooth. They form a bimodal distribution with all of the Subarus considerably slower and worth less points than the Roofs. This makes selecting a viable car difficult. I don't want to waste money buying cars that don't end up working, so I head onto the internet and find out exactly how the point system works. I found a post from 2005 written by a dude named Wild Cobra Z28, and what he had written was incredible. He had found a formula for how the game calculates the amount of points offered. The points offered formula was pretty simple. It takes the average of the 5 AI cars, then subtracts the value of your car and adds 60. This basically means that the opponent's average has to be 140 points higher than the rating of my car in order to be offered a 200 point race. He also lists every car in the game with the amount of points they are worth for both brand new and worn out, and multiplicative formulas on how to account for switching the tyres on your car. Furthermore, apparently only the front tyres on the car are factored into for the calculation, so that can be a handy bit of knowledge for later. This still doesn't prove easy when selecting my car. Normally compared to all of the AI competition, my car is ranked around here, and the AI cars I race against are in this mid to high section, which bring the average up enough so I get a 200 point race. This can't be done for the boxer spirit, because there are no cars that exist in this mid to high region. Whether I like it or not, I'm going to have to use a car that's down here, and beat a car or two up here. I settle on buying a car recommended on the forums, a used Subaru Legacy B4 Blitzen, and buy a bunch of upgrades for it, including the fully customizable suspension, so I can tinker with some of the settings that will help with cornering. The first race is at Hong Kong, a track that I don't usually like, but in this case, it helps me a lot. The tight corners prevent the high speed roofs from using their power advantage to completely demolish me. The lineup looks pretty good, up against four Subarus and the worst of the roofs but it actually ends up being my downfall. The point average isn't high enough and I need to add 112 kilos to the car, which ends up making the car more difficult to corner. After resetting for about 20 minutes, I end up with this near perfect lineup. Two Impressors in the lead with the fastest cars in 5th and 3rd place. Having the Impressors in the lead will hold up the faster roofs while I make my way through the pack. I drive extremely aggressively, burning through half my NOS before the first lap even ends and I've only moved up into third position. Another factor that makes this race extremely difficult is the length. Four laps is about twice as long as previous races, lessening the effectiveness of my NOS. The Impressors might be the slower cars in the race, but without NOS, there would be no way I even stand a chance. With two bars of NOS left on the back straight of lap 3, I decide to make my move on the lead Impreza and nudge it into the barricade so I can take a clean racing line. 
I'm finally in the position I want to be, but with no NOS left and the other cars constantly gaining, I'm gonna have to defend like a maniac to win. Karma comes back to me though. On the final lap of that same hairpin, I completely forget to brake and send myself into the barricade and get overtaken by the roof. But that's okay, because the next corner isn't too far away and we hit an instant replay of my legendary overtake. I defend my position to a win. Race 2 had me against a weaker lineup again, so I chucked a few dozen bricks back into my car. Three laps of Infineon Raceway was definitely easier than four laps at Hong Kong. The sweeping bends make it easier for me to keep speed through the corners, and I don't have to use as much NOS to maintain that speed. The AI doesn't drive particularly well on this course either. They seem to slow down way too much for the back hairpin, and then they drive through the S-bends way too casually, giving me plenty of opportunities to gain and overtake. Race 3 at Deep Forest had me cycling through a few lineups, trying to get a good order for the opponents. Eventually, I got one with two roofs in 3rd and 5th. The first half of lap 1 makes me think I can't win this race, but this is the highest speed section of the course. Just like at Infineon, the AI drives poorly on the inner portion of Deep Forest, giving me plenty of opportunities to overtake. I'd have to give the Boxer Spirit a 7 out of 10 for difficulty. The first race in Hong Kong was by far the toughest. The slow angular corners forced me to burn through my NOS to accelerate when exiting the bends, and there wasn't a section of the track that AI particularly drove bad at. And let's not forget that I wasn't even able to get a clean win there. I head back into the beginner hall to attempt the compact car championship, and apparently I forgot to hit record for the first race, which I ended up winning. To enter this competition, you need to use a car that is shorter than 4000mm, so I enter with my BE1. This is the first championship series, and I can explain to you how they work. For each place in the series, you are given points based on your position. 10 for a win, 6 for second place, 4 for third, then 3, 2, and then 1. In order to complete a championship, just have more points than anyone else. This means I technically don't have to come first in every race to win. To help, you can also qualify for each race during a championship, so you can actually start in pole position to give yourself the best possible start. And this is actually easy because you can power up your car for the qualifying, then scale it back down for the actual race to make it 200 points. These factors definitely make it easier, but you also have to race consistently well. A couple of big mistakes can be the difference between getting 2 points and getting 20 points, and racing consistently well in a car that is underpowered is never easy. A tiny mistake on lap 2 caused my car to understeer, and with a lack of power I'm easily undercut by the AI, but fortunately with the NOS I'm able to keep within distance and retake the lead on the next corner. The same thing happens on the same corner of lap 3, and then lap 4. This time, I'm unable to take my position back and I wait until the hairpin before the back straight. I completely botch this maneuver and while I don't lose any positions, the lead car pulls far ahead. There was absolutely no hope of regaining the lead and I'm forced to defend my second place so I don't drop through the ranks any further. Race 3 goes much the same as race 2. I manage to qualify first and defend my lead until the hairpin just before the home straight, where more understeer causes me to get undercut. I was also running this car with fairly close gear ratios so my top speed was only 169km per hour. I was able to keep up with the lead car on the winding back sections of the track, but it would always pull out a bigger lead on the long straight with a higher top speed. I almost finished in third place, but I blocked the car behind me to defend my position. After three races, I'm only barely in first place ahead of the Opel and the Audi. Race 4 was at Hong Kong, a track I've become very familiar with. Fortunately I didn't have too much trouble with it this time. After starting in pole position, defending the lead on this track was rather easy because it's so narrow. With a 6 point lead into the final race, as long as I don't completely cark it, I should have this in the bag. Race 5 was a twin ring Mategi East configuration, yet another circuit I've had plenty of experience on. With the high speed corners and understeer, I make yet another small mistake that costs me my lead position, and while I feel like I make a decent move to retake it, the other car completely just outpowers me through the S-bends. I'm never able to retake the lead as the gap widens, but I don't drop any more positions and finish 8 points ahead of 2nd place. I would have to give this a 5 out of 10 for difficulty, due simply to how I'm able to qualify for pole position before each race. I think I could have also chosen a better car and setup for this competition. After losing a position, I'm almost never able to take it back, even with NOS. If I was forced to start in last place each race, with this car and setup, 
I don't think I would have been able to win. The next event is the Tuning Car Grand Prix, and for this I go and buy what is the absolute best car for this challenge run, the Lotus Elise 111R. This car is rated lowly for points for how good it is, super easy to drive and takes off like a bullet when used with NOS. I buy a whole bunch of different parts for this car because I'll be using it for multiple events, including a rear wing so I can adjust the downforce on the car. I haven't spoken about downforce yet, but like the power to weight ratio, it also affects the points rating for the car. But in this competition, I end up leaving the downforce at 0-0, which I believe is the same as not having the wing at all. This is another championship series, so I'm able to qualify for pole position before each of the five races. Just like the Boxer Spirit, the tougher cars in this competition are the roofs, but the other cars aren't complete slouches, so they form a pretty smooth distribution for points offered. Even though I'm running at only about 230 horsepower, or the other cars are around 450, I'm quite easily able to maintain my lead in the first race, and only the Yellow Bird was able to come close to pressuring me. The second race at Fuji was a little different. The extremely long home straight had my car reach its top speed, and the Yellow Bird was able to catch up. I tried to block, and when I was bumped, my car started sliding, causing me to spin out and crash. By the time I recovered, I was way back in second place. But this is no worries for the Elise. Over the next lap and a half, I'm able to claw my way back into first position, and I end up finishing with a pretty decisive win. Not much to mention in race 3 at Tokyo R246, I easily crushed the AI here. Race 4 at El Capitan was a lot tougher. The undulating track was really unsettling for the lightweight Elise with no downforce, and the car would lose grip when coming down from a crest. After losing a position, the Yellow Bird and I would battle it out over the next lap, with each of us making mistakes. And I had my final chance to take the lead after it completely went off course, and I screwed it up by losing all my speed in the gravel. I had to settle for second place here. In the final race, the opponents don't even put up a fight. Tuning Grand Prix, 3 out of 10 for difficulty. Naturally Aspirated Series is next and we are back to individual races. I take the turbo out of my Elise since this competition doesn't allow turbos or superchargers, which drops the horsepower to 210, and I also swap out a few other parts and make a few alterations. The Mighty Elise absolutely annihilates this series. Depending on the level of competition, I'll change my tyres from anywhere between road and sports mediums. Race 3 was at the Twin Ring Mategi full circuit, and I had raced on the shorter configuration so much, I accidentally took a wrong turn and ended up in 5th, only for me to work my way back up the pack to get a win. That's how good the Elise is. I'm not going to try and say there aren't a couple of scary cars to try and avoid here. The Pagani Zonda C12 and the Proto Motors Spirit can both be trouble if they start in pole position, but even then, it's absolutely possible to still get a win if you drive well. 3 out of 10 for difficulty. In the MR Challenge, we find another bimodal distribution of opponents. There's two potential Honda NSXs, and then everything else. The forums say make sure at least one of the NSX is in the race to boost the points average, but make sure they don't start in pole position because you will never catch it. I found this to be pretty true if you also use the forum suggested car of a used Toyota MR2, but I found an even better car, the MGTF 160. If both NSXs were racing, I could get away with using the sports medium tyres, and I was even able to win with an NSX starting in pole position on Autumn Ring. Although, I had to basically do a perfect race, use nearly all my NOS, and even then I was only barely able to win by overtaking on the final straight. If you get the lineups with the NSXs at the back, this is a 3 out of 10 for difficulty. And then I hit another major roadblock, the World Classic Car Series. This is another championship where I just need to win via total points after 5 races. This doesn't really help me this time though, it's the line of potential cars that's an absolute killer. In this series, all cars must be produced before the 1970s, and for some reason, Polyphony Digital decided to put the absolute widest range of competition here. You could be up against cars like the Citroen 2CV with 14 horsepower, or something like the Buick Special with 576 horsepower, and it's really not like this is an outlier. When I showed you this graph for the Boxer Spirit, I kinda exaggerated the difference between the Subarus and the Roofs. Instead of this, it's more like this. But if I was to also put on the range of cars from the World Classic Car Series, it would appear something like this. The range of cars here is absolutely massive. If I'm usually selecting a car around here to get a 200 point race, where and how do I select a car for this massively wide range of opponents? 
The Skyline I won from the FR challenge didn't seem so viable anymore. When placed against the set of opponents that can show up, my car falls here being worth 861 points. The 5 best cars here from the Buick to the Mercedes Benz are not only in the league of their own, there is considerable separation between even themselves. Just to show you the difference between how good these cars are, here is a lineup with both the Mercury Cougar and the AC427 racing. Even though I know these cars aren't beatable, the race is only 120 points because the other cars are so poorly rated. Because there is such a massive difference between each car here, it's impossible for me to choose a car that can beat them all whilst also getting a 200 point race. Looking back at the table of opponents, I need an ultra specific set of them to show up, and then I need to use a car that's just a little worse than that. So I go and buy a used Nissan Skyline 1500 Deluxe. This car doesn't end up working for me very well in testing. The opponents that I'm able to get the lead on very early from the stationary start end up re-overtaking me later on the high speed sections of the track and there's just no hope for me catching up. I keep resetting to try and get a better order for the viable opponents, but after an hour and a half of this and Hail Mary attempts, I call it a day and consult the old forums for help. Everyone agreed that racing against any of the top tier cars was completely fruitless and it's better to use a slow car against slow to medium opposition with them also starting in a very good order. The recommended car I found was a Honda S600 and the very specific lineup I went against was this. There are two very scary cars here, the Elan and the 2000 GT. This lineup took me about 50 minutes of resetting to get and while the order isn't completely optimal, I was just eager to perform a legitimate attempt. The first race at Fuji is a stationary start and I know I can easily take the lead before the first corner with the help of NOS, so I don't bother qualifying. Although there is a massive difference between the power of the 2000 GT and the Alfa Romeo or Silvia, they both accelerate poorly and the main difference is only seen once they get up to speed. With the 2000 GT starting in 4th, it will struggle to get through the traffic and I can focus on just beating the Elan. This plan works perfectly and while the 2000 GT is able to work its way to 3rd, it's still 5 seconds behind me and I'm able to hold the Elan off to my first win. Race 2 is at El Capitan and once again it's a stationary start so I don't bother qualifying. I take an early lead again but this time the 2000 GT works its way to 3rd right off the line as it's able to navigate better as all the other cars fold into the racing line. I'm under pressure immediately from the Elan as it tries to find an opening to pass me. After a few successful attempts of blocking it, the 2000 GT manages to work its way into 2nd. On the hilly section, the 2000 GT goes for a bold move on the outside and I try to force it wide, but it's able to accelerate past me and I hit a barricade and drop to third, with the Elan now in the lead. I burn a lot of NOS to try and catch back up and I manage to get back into second place on the home straight. I try to drive smoothly and use a bit more NOS in the exit of corners to try and work my way into the lead, but this doesn't go my way. I pushed a bit too hard on one of the corners and went wide again, hitting the barricade and bouncing off and luckily blocking the 2000 GT. The Elan immediately pulls out a 2.5 second lead and all I focus on doing now is making sure I don't finish third. I'm hounded for the rest of the lap and drive extremely defensively, trying to prevent the inevitable overtake. On the lead up to the final curve, I'm undercut by the Toyota as it takes the inside line, but I don't panic and on the exit, I burn the last bit of NOS I have and retake second place before the finish line. Race 3 was at the Nordschleife and I got a bit careless. I know this track was a rolling start so I should have taken the time to qualify for pole position. This would have taken about 20 extra minutes to perform the two laps, but I didn't think it would be worth it. I was so wrong. Being the toughest track in the game and having over 150 corners, even a single lap is enough to burn through my entire tank of NOS. The rolling start makes it virtually impossible for me to take the lead early on, and even working my way through the pack takes a lot of effort. It takes me more than half a tank to work my way up into second place, and it's already become evident to me that first place is not going to be possible. On the high speed section on the back of the track, I work through even more of my NOS trying to maintain second place, but both the Toyota and one of the Alphas manage to slip past me before the tight corner at the end. With a third of the course to go, I try and drive conservatively while staying within striking distance. The AI is just too fast for me though and they pull out a massive lead before the long straight where they'll just pull away even further. I have to settle for fourth place and with a first, second and fourth, I'm seven points behind the Elan. Race four is at Côte d'Azur, 
a city circuit with a lot of tight corners. Before doing anything, I shorten the gear ratios to make sure I have more acceleration as top speed is not a priority here. This circuit is another rolling start and this time, I make sure to start in pole position. Of all the races so far, this one is the easiest. The Elan and 2000 GT are never able to use their high top speed to outpace me on long straights. And given the course is extremely narrow, relatively short and focuses on low speed cornering, I'm able to use my only advantage and power out of each corner faster than any other car here. I was never under any pressure and I managed to finish with a lead of a little over 2 seconds. Laguna Seca is the final race and is yet another rolling start. I'm still 3 points behind the Elan so I think I have to make sure I get another win here. Which is funny because after qualifying, the Elan only manages to qualify 5th. I've absolutely got this one in the bag. I crush the other cars here. An even easier race than the previous one. Honestly, I'd have to give the World Classics an 8 out of 10 for difficulty. Only the first 3 races caused me trouble when I switched to using the S600. But the amount of time I spent researching viable cars to use and viable opponents to race against including the time spent resetting trying to get that good lineup of cars was an absolute nightmare. Not something I particularly enjoyed doing. After this I head back to complete some of the easier series. In the four wheel drive challenge I start out using the legacy blitzen I had used earlier and managed to win the first race. This one took me a lot of resets but I managed to get basically a perfect lineup of cars with the fastest at the back and the slowest at the front. I'm never able to get this or a similar lineup again for races 2 through 5 and I'm also never able to get another win with the Legacy. I decide to buy another 4 wheel drive car, a used Mitsubishi 3000 GT which fared much better at getting 200 points in those last 4 races, 5 out of 10 for difficulty. In the lightweight K Cup, only cars shorter than 3400mm are allowed to enter. That little Elan I was using before is actually too good for this event, so I go and buy a midget. A Daihatsu midget D-Type, and put some mad rims on it. I didn't have too much trouble here once finding a setup that allowed me to get 200 point races. The order of the AI was pretty important as well. They are all very similar in power, but there are some cars that are definitively better than others. I needed a slow car in the lead, and then successively faster cars to boost the points. The speed differential between two adjacent cars couldn't be too much, otherwise they would overtake and make it harder for me. Even with NOS, it's very hard for anyone to overtake because of the low speeds. 5 out of 10 for difficulty. The last series I'm going to breeze over was for Spider and Roadsters. The MGTF 160 makes a return here and the setup is very similar to when I used it in the MR challenge. Because there are no major threats or point boosters, or maybe because the MGTF 160 is just that good, the order of the AI doesn't matter too much here and I didn't reset a single time for a different lineup of cars. I set the extra weight at 166kg and managed to win each of the 3 races in 2 or less attempts. 2 out of 10 for difficulty. The penultimate challenge is the Supercar Festival which features 5 individual races. For this, I'll need a production car that exceeds more than 493 horsepower. This amount of power isn't too much of a problem here because many of the possible opponents use cars in the mid 500s and a couple even reach over 600, with the Cadillac CN reaching 749 horsepower. The actual issue here is that some of the opponent cars are underpowered. The Honda HSC, Nissan R390 and a few others come in with less than the required 493 horsepower, which drags the point average down. Another thing is that many of the opponent cars are unusable because they aren't a production car. The Cadillac, Tommy Kyra ZZ2 and the Volkswagen W12 Nardo never made it into production in real life, and thus, they aren't allowed in this event. These are some of the most dangerous opponents to race against, but they do boost the point average by a lot. I settle on buying a Callaway C12, a car that starts below the power threshold. I give it an oil change which gives it a small boost in power for the first 200km, and then after buying the other usual upgrades, including a Stage 1 NA tune, my car is at 498 horsepower, and then I'm shocked to see that I'm still not allowed into the event. The dealerships love to lie about how much power a car is outputting in this game. I head back to the home garage to see the true power of my car. There is a way around this though, I go and buy a stage 2 NA tune which pushes the C12's power into the mid 500s and enter the first event at Seoul. Once I'm in the event, 
I can adjust the parts and settings of my car, and here, I just swap out the Stage 2 NA tune for the Stage 1 tune, depowering my car back to how I wanted to use it. I also fiddle with some of the suspension settings after watching a YouTube tutorial on how to enhance the handling of a car. The first lineup I try to beat is this one, with all three of the scary cars racing. Soul is a race with a rolling start, and since it isn't a championship, I have no option but to start from the back of the pack. This configuration of opponents is probably impossible to beat. I've burnt three quarters of my NOS and I've only managed to work my way into third place, and I can't even see the first placed car. I have to reset for a different lineup for about 50 minutes until I get this one. The R390 in the lead, which despite being underpowered and dragging the points down, is not as bad as it seems. It's still the slowest car here, but it does a decent job of slowing the pace of the other cars. The SLR McLaren is a top tier car points wise, but it isn't actually all that great. It's very heavy, struggles to corner, and uses its 600 horsepower effectively. The Chisetta and Celine are just decent competition that don't drag the points down too much, and the 5th place car is the big points booster, the CN. It takes me 1.5 laps and almost half my NOS to get into first position, and immediately after, I take a poor line through a corner letting the R390 past, and then the big CN comes and just barrels its way past me. It makes a move on the R390, but the narrow straight ends and it puts itself in a terrible position, allowing not only me, but the Celine to pass it. I manage to retake the lead at the start of lap 3, and pray that the other cars can hold off the CN for as long as possible. Towards the end of lap 5, I made a fatal error. I misjudged the braking distance in the CN, which had worked its way up into second, manages to overtake me. While it's still within range, I burn through the remainder of my NOS to try and retake the lead, but it's just too tough. The CN can outpace my car even whilst I'm in the slipstream, and I have to concede defeat. I keep trying this exact lineup of cars for the next 45 minutes, trying to drive the perfect race. Eventually, I manage to get one where by the middle of lap 5, the CN has only just worked its way up into second, and I have a 5.5 second buffer. Over the next two laps, the CN closes the gap on me and I'm forced to drive defensive with no NOS left. On the second to last corner of lap 7, I take what I think is a safe and defensive line, but the Cadillac squeezes its way past me. I thought I was completely done here, but it takes a wide line into the final corner and I'm able to pull up alongside it and I nudge it wide into the barricade, buying me a small buffer for the final lap. The CN makes another attempt to overtake me before the end of the home straight, but eventually it has to break to make the sharp hairpin. The inside line it took and the extra speed it had caused it to take the corner poorly, and I had pulled out another significant lead. Just before the end of the circuit, it has one final sniff of my rear bumper, but I'm able to hold it off to a win. Race 2 at Fuji was even more difficult than race 1. I eventually managed to get another extremely good lineup with the CN at the back and three other very solid cars directly ahead of it. The lead car is the worst one you can race against and it tanks the points, so to get a 200 point race here, I have to bump up the extra weight to 195 kilos. Almost every attempt I did was a 5 horse race. Usually the Celine and the Ford would pull into first and second, then me, then the Zonda and finally the CN. I had a pretty clever game plan for this race. I was going to hang around in third, and to conserve NOS, I was going to use the slipstreams of the Ford and the Celine. I also didn't want to leave a massive gap in front of the Zonda, so I would let it slipstream me, and this would help it defend against the CN. Towards the end of the race, I would use some NOS to pull into the lead and defend from the front. This strategy was pretty successful, and the Zonda was doing a decent job. Eventually though, the CN would definitively overtake the other AI, and I had to move my way up the pack so I was always ahead. The best race of the session came after about an hour of attempts. I made my way into the lead on the final lap, and in my rear view mirror, I see the CN overtake the Ford GT. I'm able to defend most of the final lap, but near the end of the race it makes a move on the outside and I try to gently steer it into the grass. I end up clipping the grass myself and take myself out of the race gotta do better than that. I know I could easily cheese this by cutting across the chicane at the end of the circuit on each lap, but I don't really want to win like that. Shortly after, I get another good attempt and it's a drag race to the finish line. <laughs> you 
No! I didn't. Re I really didn't want to ram. <laughs> I really didn't. My luck eventually ran out with this lineup. On many of the following attempts, the CN just kept making its way through the pack earlier and earlier, and I was trying to defend the lead from it as early as lap 3. So I just gave up with this lineup, and while grinding for a new one, T Kanji popped in to help me out. T Kanji had messed around with tuning almost every single car in the game, and had created a 300 plus page document to cover each and every one of them. Obviously, I didn't have to read through all of it right away, but he did quickly help me out with optimizing the Callaway C12. Firstly, on basically every car, both the ASM oversteer and understeer should be set to zero. ASM helps keep traction during a corner by slowing the car down. By turning them to zero, I found the car more in my control, as the assistance would never kick in. I did have to drive a little more carefully, but I was able to corner considerably quicker. Any added weight to the car was put all the way to the back of the C12. Since this is a rear wheel drive car, the extra weight focused at the back helped prevent wheel spin. Finally, the traction control system was lowered to the lowest value I could get it to that would also prevent wheel spin from the start line. With T's help, I was able to beat the new lineup of opponents within a couple of tries. Race 3 was at New York, another rolling start on a city course with lots of 90 degree corners. The power boost from the oil change had finally worn off after I had done so many attempts at the first two races, and this was a bit of a blessing. I could more easily get 200 point races without having to race against the CN. I still spent about 2 hours on this race because the AI liked taking this particular corner without slowing down enough and ended up consistently using me as their brakes. Race 4 at midfield was a breath of fresh air. I was able to get a winnable lineup first try and was even able to do it without any extra weight in the car. Whether taking the weight out helped or not is debatable, because it gave the car slightly less grip when I needed it to exit the corners, and I would find the tail would slide out more than I liked. The lead Celine would do a decent job of holding off the Nardo and the ZZ2, and I was able to get a win here within 40 minutes. Race 5 at Infineon was the easiest of them all. Even with the rolling start and having all of the faster cars in the start of the pack, I was able to get a win here with only a few attempts. The AI just don't drive particularly well on this circuit and there are plenty of opportunities to gain and overtake them. The Supercar Festival was easily the hardest event to complete with 200 point races so far. Perhaps I could have selected a better car to do this with, as the C12 definitely had handling and acceleration issues that fundamentally made it challenging. Nevertheless, I'm giving this a 9 out of 10 for difficulty. Finally, I'm at the home stretch. I've unlocked the Gran Turismo World Championship. This is a 10 race championship series, so once again I just need to have the most points at the end to win. The car I choose to use is the Pagani Zonda race car, a car I won from completing driving missions 21 through to 24. The only upgrades I buy are racing hard tyres, the Stage 3 Turbo, and NOS. All race cars come fitted with most of the upgrades, and since I'm up against other race cars, I don't have the subtle advantages I had in all of the other competitions. Like in the World Classics, the speed tiers of the opponents here are extremely wide, and with my car at 870 horsepower, I need to go up against the best of the best in order to be offered 200 points. After only a few resets, I managed to get this absolutely terrifying lineup. Out of the 22 possible cars that can show up, 4 of them are in the top 5 fastest cars in the event. This isn't such a bad thing though, because I know all of them wear their tyres out pretty quick and will have to pit on this first race. After qualifying for pole position, I get to see exactly where I stand. Immediately off the line, first, second and third overtake me, and while this wasn't too surprising, I'll be able to stay in the slipstream and would remain within close proximity. This is not how it went. They just kept pulling further and further away from me, and eventually, I was overtaken by the fourth placed car. I tried to remain in the slipstream again, but all these cars are easily able to outpace me with their elite cornering. I didn't totally expect to remain ahead of them as my game plan was to overtake them whilst they would be in the pits. As long as I remained within 25 seconds of the leader, I still had a chance. This didn't work either. As everyone's tyres warmed up, the AI was able to drive better and better and eventually I was overtaken by the last place 2J, which I know for a fact does not need to pit in this race. This isn't even the worst of it. My racing hard tyres don't even last the whole race and I limp the car across the finish line more than a minute behind the leaders. The Zonda was not going to be the car to do the job, and to be honest, it wasn't my first choice either. 
the car I really wanted to use was out of my price range as I had burnt through most of my money. I didn't feel like grinding for more money and luckily there was a way to win the car I wanted to use. So it was time to hop back into the little release and take on the All Japan GD Championship. For some reason, this competition doesn't require you to use a Japanese car, and the best car I thought I could pull it off with was the Lotus. Even with a 150 horsepower disadvantage against proper race cars, the Elise handled itself pretty well. T Kanji had once again helped me tune the car to a spec he liked using. Most of these races were pretty close and I was consistently finishing in the top 3. Another thing that had been plaguing my attempts was constant controller disconnections, and in a 10 championship race where you need to consistently place well, this was never good. The worst race I had was at Hong Kong, I had nearly half a dozen disconnections and I finished last. The final race at Suzuka had me trailing by 3 points against the Nismo. As I had gone for pole position on most of the races, the Nismo would end up qualifying second and if I had a bad race, it always ended up getting the maximum 10 points. I didn't bother qualifying for the last race, and the Nismo starting in 5th would hopefully be slowed up by the other cars. This ended up being true, and the Nismo finished 3rd while I secured the championship by finishing 1st in the final race. While I won a whole lot of money, I got what I had really come for, the modal pitwork Z. With T Kanji helping once again, we tuned the car in a very particular way, specifically to help preserve the tyres on these long races. I also had to reset a lot for this pretty specific lineup of cars. The Minolta and C9 were extremely quick but had poor tyre wear, and would have to pit on just about every race. The Peugeot 905 and Pescarolo aren't quite as quick as the other two, but they have very good tyre wear and would not have to pit on many of the races, and would actually end up beating the two faster cars, helping distribute the points. I knew that beating the Minolta and C9 straight up was going to be impossible, but I also knew that with the pit stop that they required on this race, all I would need to do was stay ahead of the Peugeot and Pescarolo. The first race was going pretty well. I had managed to maintain second place for the first two laps, but as the race went on, the AI's laps were getting quicker and quicker, until I was overtaken by the Pescarolo at the end of lap 5, and then the Peugeot at the end of the home straight. I was never able to get in front of those two cars again, and I started to think that the Z was not going to be able to do this either. Even after the lead Minolta pitted, it was still able to outpace and beat me on the final lap and I ended up finishing in 4th place. I pressed on though, as this was a 10 race series, maybe I could do better on the other circuits. Race 2 at Super Speedway did not go better. This one was all about speed and my car was the least powerful of them all. I was able to do this without pitting and ended up finishing 4th again, but the Peugeot and Pescarola would do the same and ended up beating me by more than 1 lap. Race 3 was 18 laps at Hong Kong and I was interested in seeing how well my car and the AI would perform here on the tight corners. The 18 laps would mean every car would pit at least once here, and all these ultra powerful opponents likely wouldn't be able to utilise their main advantage against me. This didn't end up being true either. The C9 and Minolts were completely able to outpace me. I was only in the lead for about half of lap 11 as the two lead cars had pitted, but I would get overtaken before I made my way into the pits. I ended up finishing third. At this point, it was pretty clear to me that I wasn't going to be able to win with this car. I attempted races 4 and 5 but after trying to do a no pit stop strategy on El Capitan and crashing out, I gave up on the pitwork Z. I did have another backup car in mind, the Chaparral 2J, but to spare you the time, I couldn't get a win with it either, even with T Kanji's help tuning it. One thing that was clear to me was that I was getting blown out any time high speed was a factor. I had to brake earlier for corners because my car was heavier and I wasn't able to take high speed corners as well as the Le Mans prototypes because their cars have more downforce than mine. I had to reassess what cars I could use, and I came to the conclusion that I myself would also have to use a Le Mans prototype. The only problem was that all these cars cost a lot of money and have the highest point values in the game. I could get around this though by buying one of these cars used. Between days 694 and 700, four special black LMP cars will appear in the used car showrooms, costing anywhere between 1.3 million and 2.9 million credits. The only issue I had was that I was at day 761, and I didn't have anywhere near enough money to purchase one of these cars. The black LMP cars would appear again on day 1394, so I hopped back into the Elise and grinded the Sukuba Wet Medium Special Condition Race to pass the days by. 
I ended up raising enough money to buy two of these black LMP cars, but the only one I really wanted to use was the iconic Mazda 787B. I did have enough money to buy the brand new version of this car, but the used version has some major benefits. Because it's done so many miles already, the oil and engine are worn out and it's lost some of its power, but that means it's worth less points than the brand new version. After equipping NOS and the racing hard tyres, this dropped the point value to 1768, and in order to get a 200 point race, I needed the average of the opponents to exceed 1908 points. This was no quick feat. Out of a selection of 22 possible cars, I needed the game to pick no less than 3 of the top 5 cars, and then the other two cars needed to be very highly rated, and of those two, at least one of them had to have good tyre wear. I reset for about an hour and a half in order to get this lineup, which included the Nissan R92, which is the second most valuable, the Minolta, which is the third most, the Nissan R89, the fourth most, the Bentley, which is the sixth most, and the Peugeot, a car with phenomenal tyre wear and is the 13th most valuable. The average of these opponents was 1,910 points. And finally, I was ready to race. This time, I didn't have T Kanji helping me out with any special settings on the car. All I did was turn the ASM oversteer and understeer down. If he was here to help me this time, he would have reminded me to buy a very important thing, the rigidity refresher. Because I wasn't sure if this would affect the points rating of my car, I chose to play it safe and not buy it. This will come into play later. The 787 proved to be a much better car than the Pitwork Z or the 2J, as it was able to corner more consistently at high speeds with the increased downforce. Even after several laps, I was able to maintain a small lead over the other faster opponents, which I knew would pit near the end of the race. The lack of rigidity was somewhat felt through the faster corners. The car would wobble and destabilize, costing me a position or two, but with a no pit stop strategy, I was barely able to pull a win over the Peugeot at Tokyo. Super Speedway was up next and it was the first race where I wasn't able to qualify for pole position as I was beaten for speed by the Minolta. During the race I tried to stay within its slipstream, but every time I came to one of the high speed corners, I would have to slow down slightly more than the other competitors and the two Nissans would eventually overtake me on lap 7. The three lead cars would eventually pit on lap 14 and while I was leading the race again, the Peugeot and Bentley were right behind me. The high speed left handers took its toll on my front right tyre and I was forced to slow down more and more to maintain grip, letting the Peugeot take the lead with 3 laps to go. I tried to stay within range for another overtake manoeuvre, but every time I got to the sharper corner, I had to slow down far more than the 905. I ended up finishing second. I initially thought the third race at Hong Kong would be pretty easy. The narrow road and all the low speed corners would reduce the disadvantage I had against the other cars. Furthermore, I was tied on points with the Peugeot after we each placed first and second, and I knew it wouldn't do well here as it would have to pit even in this race against the faster opposition. As the race went on, the Minolta and two Nissan slowly closed the gap on me as their tyres heated up. Just before the sharp hairpin, I was hit from behind by the AI and I lost control of my car conceding two positions. This was not good because I knew I had to pit on this race. I would have to work my way back into first. Well, despite me using NOS and taking more risks, I wasn't able to catch up. Instead, they both pulled away and by lap 9 they had a 7.5 second lead. On lap 10, we all pit and I made the executive decision to change my tyres from the hard compound to the medium compound. If I began the race with the mediums, then these wouldn't be 200 point races, but since the game doesn't change the amount of points you are offered mid-race, this is okay. With all our tyres starting out cold again, the AI wouldn't be as quick as the few laps before the pit stop. By softening the compound of my own tyres, mine also heat up and became grippier a lot quicker than theirs, and within 2 laps, I would overtake 2nd place. I continued to gain more than a second per lap against the lead car, eventually overtaking it on the same corner it caused me to crash on. The medium tyres would last the final 8 laps of the race as I held on to 1st position. Race 4 at Seoul was extremely easy. After qualifying for pole position, I slowly pulled out a lead over the opposition for the first few laps. Once the opponent's tyres warmed up, they did start to gain on me for about 8 laps before they started to drop away again from tyre degradation. While the faster competitors in this race had to pit, I did this race without a pit stop and won by nearly half a minute. 
El Capitan was no joke. This one was an absolute monster. Unlike the previous race at Seoul, I am never able to pull away from the opposition and we are about equal in terms of speed. This circuit is murderous on the tyres and all of us would have to pit. Well, maybe not all, because the Peugeot almost always does this race without a pit stop. I remained in the lead until lap 6 when the rigidity of my car and slightly worn out tyres gave way and my car understeered heavily into the barricade. I didn't lose too much pace, courtesy of the bump from the AI, but it was going to be tough to get back into the lead. I decided to risk going at a ridiculous speed over the crest chicane, one of the most unsettling parts of the track, and completely blitz the Minolta, and then I dive bombed the Nissan before the following hairpin and retook first place. At the end of lap 6, I decide to pit while all the other cars stay out on the track. I switch to medium tyres again and decide to do the final 5 laps with the Grippier compound. Two laps later, the two Nissans and Toyota pit. I've managed to outpace them by a couple of seconds and I'm bumped back into third place. At the end of lap 10, the Bentley finally concedes and pulls into the pits, allowing me an easy overtake into second place. The Peugeot on the other hand has the tyre durability and manages to pull off the no pit stop strategy and beats me by 14 seconds. There isn't much to say about the 6th race at New York as it went much the same as the race at Seoul given the courses are quite similar. While this circuit is more complex and has more right angled corners, I'm quickly able to pull out a sizeable lead. I'm confident that both Nissans and the Minolta pit here, but I have no idea what the Peugeot does. Towards the end of lap 10, I realised that even if I were to pit, my lead over the Peugeot is so large that it would never overtake me. I decide to pit and easily crush my opponents for another first place. After 6 races, I was feeling decently confident in the standings with a 16 point lead. As long as I continued to finish races ahead of my nearest competitor, the Peugeot, I would be able to win the championship. And this is where things started to go very, very bad. The 7th race was at Opera Paris. If there was any track I hated more than Hong Kong, it was this one. While the style of the circuit is rather similar with its tightness and angular corners, it's also a very uneven surface to race on, and cars without proper suspension tuning really struggle here. This is definitely one race I could have used T Kanji's help. By the second lap, the R92 is putting me under major pressure. In an attempt to outbreak, I completely misjudged the braking zone at the end of the long straight and crashed straight into the barricade. I'm able to keep up with the Nissan for the next couple of laps, but at the start of lap 4, its tyres have reached optimal temperature and it starts to pull away, and this means the other cars will also be gaining on me. After a few more laps, the Nissan R92 has pulled out a massive 14 second lead whilst I'm struggling in second place. I have to admit, I did expect my driving to be poor on this circuit, and I was right. If this circuit wasn't so narrow, I definitely wouldn't be sitting in second right now, as the other cars would have easily overtaken me. On lap 8, I make another mistake, breaking late for the chicane and get bumped by the other Nissan, and I'm temporarily forced to concede second place. I maintain a close distance for about half a lap, battling for second position until I'm once again out cornered due to my car's understeer. In a single moment, second place is already far out of reach. My bad driving has forced me to accelerate and decelerate far more than necessary, and this has worn out my rear tyres. At exactly the halfway point in the race, I'm the first car to pit while all the other cars stay out on the track with their more conservative tyre wear. After all the cars have pitted, I find my poor driving has dropped me back into 5th place behind the Peugeot, and while I did drive a little better towards the end of the race, I wasn't able to overtake my closest competitor. Race 8 was at Suzuka, a course I was much more confident on and one where I knew I would be able to play strongly. If there was one race where coming 6th seemed impossible, it was this one. Well, turns out I did even worse than that. I meant to try qualify for pole position, but the second right input didn't register on my controller and I accidentally started the race in B-spec. I immediately forfeited the race and I was only 9 points ahead of the Peugeot. I felt like I was collapsing under the pressure and this was becoming one of my biggest chokes ever. Race 9 was at Grand Valley Speedway, another circuit I was fairly confident on. This time, I made sure to carefully move the cursor in the menu to qualify for pole position. Immediately off the line, I'm overtaken by the Nissan R92. I tuck in behind as I'm completely fine with the second place here. I do get the opportunity to retake the lead during the home straight, but I concede the position after braking too late and understeering at the S-Benz. Then, I have a major accident. 
I get even more understeer during the corner tunnel after the bridge. My car bounces off the curb, losing all control and dropping to fourth position, and almost get overtaken by the Peugeot. Determined to make my way back up the field into a safer position, I challenge the R89 for third place, and yet again, I misjudged the speed and braking capabilities of my car for the next corner. For my efforts, I ended up in the sand traps and trailing in last place. In just 30 seconds, things had gone from fine to disastrous. Over the next three laps, I do manage to find my groove and race smoothly. My car is still faster than the Bentley and the Peugeot, and I managed to get a couple of seconds behind the third placed car again but this is the part of the race where the AI start putting in good laps. I continue to race pretty well, but over the next couple of laps, I've lost all the ground I had made on the Nissan, and I'm once again under fire from the Peugeot. On lap five, things get very bad again. I make the same mistake on the same corner, ending up in the sand again and falling back down to sixth place. I do manage to stay about a second behind the Peugeot, but things are extremely precarious. I have no idea if the Peugeot requires a pit stop in this race. I don't even know if I require a pit stop on this race. If we both do a no pit stop strategy and it comes in first and I come in second, then the Peugeot will only be 5 points behind me in the standings, and it will absolutely come down to the final race. Or worse yet, what if we both try a no pit stop strategy and my tyres are so worn out that I'm not even able to maintain second? Race 10 will become even more of a factor. So many things are running through my mind between lap 6 and 7. But I do come to the optimal play. I can't pit in this race. I'm so far behind the 3 lead cars that if I were to pit, that would be dooming me to finish at best 5th. At the end of lap 8, all of the faster opposition cars have pitted and I'm far behind in 2nd place. At the end of lap 9, my rear tyres are heading into the orange zone and I'm starting to be unable to accelerate out of corners properly and I need to drive extremely carefully to not make any major mistakes. Through all of lap 10, I start dropping huge amounts of time as I have to slow the car right down to take most corners. It feels like I'm driving on an ice rink. The Minolta is gaining on me, but whatever happens, I must finish at least second at all costs. If the Peugeot managed to do 11 laps of El Capitan without a pit stop, it sure as hell wasn't going to pit here. Pit. Oh, it's pitting. I absolutely couldn't believe my luck. There was no way the Peugeot would place well now, so all I would have to do was finish the race strong. Easier said than done. Melted rubber is all that's left on my car's rims, and the Minolta is right on my tail from the final lap. I defend as best I can, but its fresher tyres are easily outgripping mine, and it completely dominates me through the corners. Until I have another stroke of luck. It makes the same mistake I made twice before, and sends itself off the track. I somehow managed to pull off a miracle win at Grand Valley Speedway, and with me 17 points ahead of second place, there is no way I can lose the Gran Turismo World Championship. That race at Grand Valley? Yeah. That one so, right there made me the greatest player of all time. You don't know how lucky I was until I reveal what happens in the final race. Because of my absolutely ruined rigidity, the 10th race at Lasaf goes horribly, my car is completely unstable at top speed, and any movement, whether it be from the road or me slightly adjusting the steering, causes me to lose control and crash. This is also the only race where none of the opponents pit, due to it only being 4 laps. This doesn't mean the fast opponents do well here, because they also do the final lap with worn out tyres, whereas the Peugeot would be able to do a whole extra lap without pitting. Despite it being a slower car, it's able to finish in 2nd place. If it hadn't pit at Grand Valley, we would have tied on points, and I don't want to find out how this game settles a tie. Gran Turismo World Championship? 9 out of 10 for difficulty. Finishing the game with only 200 point races was a lot tougher than I thought, and some races were way more challenging than others, perhaps because of the cars I chose to use. I wanted a way to play the game again where I was forced to buy and try different cars, and not the overpowered ones I used as a kid. I realised that modding for Gran Turismo 4 is now a thing, and while I'm not intertwined with the GT community at all, I have wondered, maybe a mod will one day exist where the points for a race can exceed 200. That way, the elite players can challenge themselves even further to win with severely underpowered cars. Thanks for watching.